Well, good morning, church. How's everybody this morning? Could you want a more beautiful day than what it is outside today? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, uh, we have a very special day here today, obviously, as you guys are gathered together here. And we are going to celebrate the uh, sacrament of baptism for Aubrey uh, Kay this morning. And uh, so we welcome you all here. I know that a lot of you drove for a long ways away to get here this morning, and we appreciate that. And uh, so we uh, are happy to be able to celebrate with you this morning. Well, we got some uh, fun things coming up here at Grace Street Church. And uh, November 12th will be the end of our 17th season for Orange Track Racing. So we followed the NASCAR series here and we had races here yesterday. So this was all a racetrack going from front to back and a uh, four lane raceway for the uh, Hot Wheels cars. And so it's a great time, uh, have a lot of fun with that. And so we're going to uh, be celebrating that. It's gonna be kind of a long day next uh, on November 12th here on our last day because we do all of the finals and all of the winning cars then they stage up for different races as they go through and it's a, a really good time. Uh, November 19th we convert this place and this whole front end over here becomes a movie screen and we're doing a movie that night and it's a free movie and it's called Christmas with a capital C and that is uh, starting at 6 p.m. doors open at 5 30 Everything is free, uh, so you're more than welcome to come. We also have uh, free popcorn, free hot dogs, free cheese dogs, which really go over well. Brownie bites, which never seem to uh, fail to please everybody. And then we have drinks and everything. Everything's free. We just invite you to come and enjoy that time together. And you can find all that information out on uh, Grace Street Church, Grace Street Cinema. So we have a little fun with that. Advent then is going to be starting on November 27 and so we have a new sermon series that's going to go along with that it's called the Advent Conspiracy and we're going to take a look at what is happening in the world as far as Christmas goes and we want to center that back on the meaning of Christmas we want to bring it back into what it's all about instead of being spend 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 and then try and figure out how you're going to pay for it all and so we want to be able to kind of reverse that and how can we actually give more to those who need it rather than just simply spend and take care of it. So we want to make sure that we can love everybody, love all of the poor, the forgotten, the marginalized, the sick that may not be able to enjoy Christmas. We have planned to try and bring this Advent conspiracy then to bring these things to light to make you kind of think about what the real and true meaning of the season is all about. Um, so we got a lot of fun things coming up and uh, a lot of great things going on here and invite you to come as you can. I know some of you got it quite a trance uh, trans to get here. So uh, we still invite you to come and be a part of the family. So Pastor Terry, if you want to come on up. Grandkids here, you don't. <laughs> they want your attention. Well, no, sure. Now she's back there helping out. Oh. There you go. Check. Can you hear me? No. 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 We'll be using it. Oh. That's all right. Can you hear me now? Oh, that's your computer. No, <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> so as we start this service of baptism this morning in here. Uh, it's a sacrament of baptism. It's a holy time to be able to bring family together, our church family together, and bring the bapti into a relationship with God. This starts the pathway then to a lifetime of grace, a lifetime of mercy, a lifetime of love in the care of Christ. And so as we start today, we would like to uh, invite everybody to come into an attitude of prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather together here in your name today to praise you, to bring honor and glory to you today, to be able to bring a young one into your care today, to bless her and bless her life as she begins this life journey with you, Lord. And 
We are here to surround her with that love and to bring her into that communion with you. So, Lord, we thank you for all these things. We thank you for the people who have been able to travel from near and far to be here today to celebrate this gathering together and this communion with you. So as we begin this service of baptism today, we just ask a blessing on everyone here today. On those who couldn't be with us today, we ask a blessing on them as well. And we just praise you and thank you for being right here in the room with us today and to lead us through this entire service. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So God delights in children. He takes pleasure in them. They are one of the greatest gifts that he gives to parents. Psalm 127.3 proclaims that children are a gift from God. They are a reward from him. As believers, we're called to recognize that, that children belong first and foremost to God. God in his goodness gives these children to us as gifts to parents. And I know, being a parent of three kids myself, sometimes they don't seem like a real good gift. But no matter what, they are still loved, they are still cared for, and they are still a gift from God for us. They not only have an awesome responsibility then as parents to care for this gift that God has given, but also the wonderful privilege of enjoying that blessing, that gift that God has given us. Because children belong to God and are given by His grace to parents. It is only proper and appropriate then that the children be baptized and dedicated to God in his service and in his love. Mark 10, 13 through 15 tells us that one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them. But the disciples, they scolded the parents for bothering Jesus. And when Jesus saw what was happening, he was very angry about it. And with his disciples, and so he said to them, Let the children come unto me, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So this relationship between Christ and the children are very important. The relationship between God and the children are very important. The relationship between you as a parent and the children are very important. You form these things today. You form this relationship, this bond that will last in eternity. So in the same way, Gabe and Marissa brought their daughter Aubrey Kay, presenting themselves first and then Aubrey before God. So Gabe and Marissa, I call your attention to the commands of God recorded in the Holy Scriptures in Deuteronomy 6.4. It tells us, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love your Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. These are the things that we need to do for our children. We have to constantly remind them of God's care, his love, his grace, and his mercy. Gabe, I'm going to invite you to bring Aubrey up She's been a little active already. <laughs> Okay. Well, Dave and Marissa, I know that you guys love God with every ounce and fiber of your energy, and that you will teach Aubrey to do the same. That's true. As you love God, you will model before Aubrey a wonderful love for God that she will want for herself. She doesn't know yet. Uh, she knows God's love and she knows your love. And when asked about the most important commandment, Jesus replied this. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. David and Marissa, by coming forward before God and his people, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your daughter Aubrey to the Lord through her baptism? If so, please respond by saying, we do. Having come freely, I ask now that you enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and his people. So that Aubrey may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you give and Marissa vow by God's help and in partnership with the church to provide Aubrey a Christian home of love and peace, to raise her in the truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline, and to encourage her to one day trust Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord. Finally, I ask that the church to make the same vow as well. There's an old proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Parents have first responsibility, but parents need the help and support of the community. So I direct my questions now to the church. By being present in God's house today, do you hereby declare yourselves to be the children of God because you trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life? If this is true, please respond by saying, we do. We do. we do. Would you please stand? <laughs> Having come freely, I ask now that you make the following commitment to those who stand before you so that Aubrey may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you vow by God's help to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ to help Gabe and Marissa be faithful to God and to help teach and train Aubrey in the ways of the Lord so that she might one day trust him as Savior and Lord. If so, accept this responsibility by responding, we do. We, we do. do. sister yeah September 9th 2018 mm -hmm. and so I asked Marissa this morning I said did you plan this and she said no I said that well, did you plan it that a, this is one year to the day that we could announce your birth and she said no God just worked it out that way yes you're gonna trust me you were in the pool last night <laughs> She's trying to kick off her shoes. She doesn't like those. Okay. Just a minute. You can take them off in a minute, okay? Okay? Oh, crap. Maybe it's warm, but it's getting cold. Here we go. Aubrey K., I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Aubrey, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh. Well, you liked it in the pool last night. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to practice. <laughs> okay, you can go back to mom and dad. You may be seated. <laughs> We were going to get away from it. <laughs> well, as we begin our worship today, we go to Romans 7.15. <laughs> and Romans 7.15 calls us into the quandary that we live in our lives every day. And it says, I don't really understand myself, for what I want to do is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Man, that's a struggle. That's humanity, human nature. See, life is, life is really a war that we're fighting as we go through. And last week I talked about spiritual warfare that we were in the middle of. And I talked about that it's going in our lives each and every day and we need to make right choices. We need to choose wisely the things we do because the choices we make, well, they make our lives. 
So if we make poor choices, we're not going to have a great life. If we choose wisely, we'll have a good life. And so this is where we need to be, and we need to be consistent in the decisions that we make in our lives. We commit ourselves to Christ, but seek to please the world, and this is our humanity that comes out in us. And the person whose spiritual nature has been reborn through Jesus experiences a constant conflict between the spiritual and the human nature. We know what is right, but we desire to do what's wrong. And that is that sin, that conflict. And it leads to an inner misery that we have. And it, it, uh, we have to go through and we have to struggle to find peace in our lives at times. The only deliverance comes through Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to be able to call upon that first. But in our human nature, we try and solve everything out ourselves. We don't turn our issues, our problems, and our trials over to God. We try and solve them ourselves because we know we can do it. So last week, I told us in our message about how we're not as strong as what we truly think we are. And so that pride that enters into there, we have to set that pride aside. And we need to call upon God and center ourselves in our decisions that we make upon God. And then we can choose wisely. God's moral imperatives are good and holy, directing us to a life at its best. Our sinful nature rebels at that call to give up any freedom and leaves us to do precisely what the law forbids. The law defines good and bad for us, and under sin's leadership, unfortunately, we tend to choose badly. The choice of bad is sin and deserves death, and thus we become aware of that nature of the sin. Have you ever done anything in your life, and then you just kind of, as you're getting ready to do it, you're just kind of going, well, this just doesn't really feel right, but you go and do it instead. You just go ahead and do it anyway. This is what I'm talking about. It's that conflict. You know the difference between good and bad, but in our sinful nature, we choose bad. So we become aware of this nature of sin in our lives. Now the choice faces me at this point in time. And we have to take that choice as each one of us. Do I sin or do I choose Christ in my life and in this situation? To choose Christ is to choose salvation by grace rather than by law. The call to obey remains, but the power of the Spirit is available then to lead us to obedience. If we choose Christ, Christ is going to lead us through that situation, through that decision. doesn't mean that we won't face the trial. We're still going to face the trial, but guess what? Christ is at our side, leading us, guiding us, and directing us through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we go through that trial, we don't go through it alone. And so we can choose wisely through Christ. The Spirit enables us to do what we wanted all along, but we're not able to because we were controlled by sin. And struggle of sin is a sign of God's presence if we're struggling to make that decision between right and wrong. That's a sign of God's presence working within us, battling within us and for us to make the correct decisions. And such a struggle assures us that the Christian life is real. And that God is real and working in our lives each and every day. Following him brings inner peace and eternal life. In Terry's message today, he's going to take us further into these things, into these truths that we find in the scriptures. And how to become consistent in our decisions. Father God, we come before you right now and we ask a blessing on Pastor Terry as he brings his message to us today that you have put upon his heart. Let us open our ears to hear, our minds to understand it, Lord, our hearts to accept it, and to live it out each and every day as we are called to make these decisions in our lives. Let us call upon you first. Lord, open us today to your worship, to your words, and to the blessings that you'll bring us into our lives. In Jesus' name. Oh, good morning. Good morning. It's a 
beautiful day. <coughs> you got your shoes off. <laughs> and they're now a chew toy, so you know. <laughs> but you're consistent. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we have started on this journey. This is week three of our pre decide uh, sermon series about making better choices to have a better life. And today we are going to be talking about the most important spiritual quality that has the greatest potential. It's not going to only impact today or tomorrow. It'll impact our month, our year, and our years until we, or until our life ends here. It's going to impact our entire life. And it's absolutely and completely the key to our spiritual strength. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit because uh, we're going to have an example uh, from the Old Testament, Daniel, who was one of the most consistent of our examples in the Bible. Now, it's key to our impact in ministry to be consistent. And when I say ministry, I mean not just myself, not just Mark, not just Chelsea, who is the executive director of Bridge Haven, and she does a lot of great ministry there. But it's all of us. We're all ministers. Because what ministry is, it's about Christians going out and meeting others' needs through love, through humility, and on Jesus' example. This quality is also the key to many other things. It's the key to physical health. It's the key to spiritual health, to relational health and intimacy, and also to accomplishing goals which can lead to ultimately to financial security. There's a lot of things that consistency comes in on. And this quality, though, is not based on appearance. It's not based on your background. It's not based on your education, nor is it based on your race. It is based on one quality and that is consistency. See, being consistent has more potential to impact our lives than you could possibly imagine. This is not the time to get discouraged and say, well, I've done everything I can. I'm basically up a creek without a paddle. We all hit that wall. Yesterday, I unfortunately had to mourn some with a friend of ours, uh, Rick, because he lost his best friend of over 30 years a week, the week before. He had gotten discouraged, and instead of looking back to God, <coughs> he took his own life. When we get in this place, it's so important that we be honest with each other and ourselves. It's inconsistency that gets us to that point. Now, y'all probably know someone who is just a little bit or maybe a whole lot OCD. Even people who are OCD, who have to have things just perfect, are inconsistent. And I know that from first-hand experience, I'm, because I'm inconsistent. But it's always done with really good intentions. And let's be honest, the only thing that a lot of us are consistent about is being inconsistent. Now, I can't tell you how many times I set out to do something only to get distracted. Now, I try my best every day to wake up and the first thing before I even put my feet on the floor to pray. But I'm inconsistent. I try to study God's word every single day. First thing. I do get it done usually at some point. I'm consistent in that it happens sometime during the day. But I like to start my day in the word. Now, you may find yourself wanting to do certain things. Specifically, certain spiritual practices like that. Yet, throughout the Bible, we read, we read and read and read about people who are inconsistent. But guess what? 
God used them anyway. He used them anyway. And listen to what Paul says. And, and this is a different translation than what Mark read for our call to worship this morning. This comes from the Amplified Version. It says this, For I do not understand my own actions. I am baffled and bewildered by them. I do not practice what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. And yielding to my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity. Those words, for I do not understand my own actions. I don't know what it is that makes me feel any better sometimes, but it's oddly comforting knowing that I can relate right back to Paul, what Paul says there. And I know that I'm tired of falling short over and over and over again because I'm inconsistent. That's today, why today we're going to talk about the power of consistency. Let's pray. Father, we pray that by the power of your word and the presence of your spirit that you would teach us, encourage us, and inspire us and move us to a God-honoring life of consistency, following Jesus, empowered by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So throughout this series, we are learning that as followers of Jesus, our decisions are incredibly and indescribably important. And we make our decisions, and our decisions make us. Because of this, we are teaching the importance of pre-deciding or making decisions ahead of time. In the first sermon of this series, we learned that with God's help, bless you, we, bless you, we can determine our course of action before the moment of decision. Last week, we learned that by pre-deciding, we can be ready for the attacks that we know Satan will be sending our way. Today, we are pre-deciding, not on our own, but with God's help, to be consistent. And so why does consistency matter? Because it always is about the why. We have to know why we're doing something before we do it. So do you know what makes people successful? They consistently do what other people do inconsistently. You can buy all the books you want about being successful. That's it, what it is in a nutshell, right there. And what we are, excuse me, what we do consistently. And today we're going to look to scripture to see why consistency matters, and how we can grow that consistency to honor God. We're going to look at someone who was consistently moral, relational, spiritual, and this person was also consistent in their leadership. So let's start with a little background on that. It was around 605 BC, so a long time ago. And this is about 18 years before the Babylonians actually destroyed Jerusalem. So let's go to Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families, who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens, and they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter royal service. See, these young men, they were actually young men. They were only maybe 12 years of age. Younger than you, Max. And why so young? Because at that age, they could be indoctrinated. They could be convinced and told what to do and pretty much not question it. 
And this is where Daniel comes into place. Daniel stood out because of his consistency and the kings that were over Babylonia each would take notice of this. Daniel had already made a name for himself with King Nebuchadnezzar and King Belteshire when Darius the Mede took over the kingdom. He naturally chose Daniel for an important role as an administrator to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Eventually, Darius made plans to Daniel to make Daniel in charge over the whole of the kingdom. And as you can imagine, this had other administrators and high officials pretty upset because these other officials and high administrators were Babylonians. So they weren't real thrilled that somebody from uh, Judah was going to be placed where they wanted it. So they were going to do what we would call in today's lingo. They were going to cancel him. Most of you probably heard that term. And somebody wants, doesn't like what somebody else is saying or doing, they want to cancel them or get them to uh, not be important anymore. They wanted to knock him down and they were bound and determined to make that happen. That probably meant that they would go and talk to the people around Daniel, people closest to him, and find someone who had a beef with him. Anyone. Any little thing that they could use. And here's the thing. If that were today, now, I'm old enough that I didn't grow up with social media. So life, if there wasn't a picture, it probably didn't happen. But now social media is out there. It's, everything is all over social media. So if, if it were today, they would have hired an entire team. And they would scour every last bit of social media to find any little piece of dirt that they could. Here's the thing. With what they had, they scoured and they dug and they dug and they dug and they couldn't find any dirt on Daniel. Daniel 6.4 says this, Then the other administrators and high officials began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So the problem they ran into was Daniel was consistent. So they finally decided that the only way that they could get to Daniel was to attack his devotion to God. So they devised a plan to get the king to sign a law that for the next 30 days, the people were only to pray to the king. And the consequences, they were strict and dire. Anyone who prayed to anyone, whether divine or human, other than the king, would be thrown into a lion's den. Darius wasn't very consistent. Without much thought, he just signed away. Now, it's important to note that any official law of the Medes and Persians could not be revoked. So he couldn't sign another law saying, oh, no, nope, that one's not any good anymore. He couldn't do that. And he, when he figured out what was going to happen, Daniel was distraught. But what did Daniel do? Daniel was consistent. He went home. He went up to his room. He went to the window that faced to the east. East, and he prayed. He prayed. Something he did every single day. And here's the thing. The officials were counting on his consistency. They knew when he prayed, and they were going to take advantage of that. And so, as soon as he did, they went straight to the king. And this is what they said. From Daniel 6, 13 through 16. He said, Then they told the king, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled. And he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. And he spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to to the law of the Medes and Persians. No law that the king signs, signs can be changed. 
So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And the king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. So what happened to Daniel? I'm thinking, if you, if you think back to earlier, you're thinking about when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace. Daniel 6, 21-23 says this, Daniel answered, Long live the king! My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. And the king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Daniel had done what he always did. He consistently trusted and had faith in God. And Daniel had already pre-decided. He pre-decided to consistently, every day, seek and have faith in God. Do you want to grow in your consistency and be more like that? I know I certainly do. Maybe you want to be an encouragement to your spouse, but every time he or she walks through the door, you pick them apart. Now, granted, you're being consistent, but in the wrong way. That's not the kind of consistency we're talking about. We're talking about a consistency of encouragement instead of tearing them down. It's time to look at three ways now that we can decide or pre-decide to be consistent. So how do we grow in consistency? To grow in consistency, we have to pre-decide that consistency. How many of you just heard that little kid's voice in your mind say, why? Why do I need to be consistent? Why do I need to do that? Well, that's where we're going to start. We have to start with the why. You have to understand what's going on. So let's go back to Daniel. Why did he pray consistently? Daniel would pray consistently in his room. He didn't. He wasn't like the Pharisees. He didn't go out in the street corner and say, "Look at me." He went to his room, to almost we could just say his prayer closet, and he prayed. When he found out about the law that the king had signed, he just went, and not just once a day, but three times a day. He had predecided that he would connect with the heart of God. This is where consistency is not a desire, but a devotion. Only having desire and not devotion is the reason so many New Year's resolutions fail. I have a desire to exercise every day. I'm not all that devoted to it. Only having desire and not devotion will not get the things done that you're trying to do. Now, when we decide to do something, we have to know the, the why. So if you want to have a better marriage, or you want to have financial stability, or you want a closer relationship with God, you have to ask yourself why you want those things. I want to quit saying two phrases that Diane hates. Does that make sense? And the other one is, here's the thing. I know I've already said that at least once. Three or four. Three or four, okay. But who's counting? <laughs> Not me. So here's the thing. Oh, Not him with love. So I, I'm, I'm probably going to have to start scribbling notes in the side of my notes here. Does not say those things. But... I also want a closer relationship with God. And why? Because I'm so sick and tired of Satan distracting me. I want to serve him wholeheartedly. It's so easy to get distracted throughout our day. As most of you know, I work in a call center. And I do technical support work. And it's so easy to forget that consistency. It's so easy to slip into the mode that the person I'm speaking in is. It's so easy to get distracted by cute kids. But those are the things 
they happen. And if you know the why, that starts with the desire. It, we have to be devoted to it. You have to be devoted to it so that you can get behind it. And then, once you've gotten behind it, you will find a way to do it. Daniel knew this, and because of that, his faith was not built in the lion's den. It wasn't built in the lion's den, it was built on his knees in his room beforehand, because he decided it. Now, I'm not picture, painting a picture of Daniel being perfect, because I'm guessing he's a little bit like me. He may have you know, had to work late so he didn't get to his evening prayer on time. So there, I'm sure he was inconsistent. So I, he's not a, 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 a saint by any means. He made his mistakes too. But he still had predecided it and he still made it happen. So that's where we have to learn to give ourselves grace. And that grace means getting back on track the next time. It's not about, oh, I, I, I missed it. I'm just not going to do it. Now, perfectionists, those of you that are in that role with me, um, you, you get to a point where, well, if I can't do it just perfect, I'm not going to do it at all. And that's not the way to do it. We just need to do it. We need to give ourselves grace. And this is why it's important when we are pre-deciding to do something that we have to plan to fail. Things will get in the way of what we pre-decided to do. Now, think of all the countless things that could have come up that prevented Daniel from praying those three times a day. It's all about our mindset. Now, any of you like to make elaborate plans on how you do something? I know Mark does for his work. He has to, otherwise things fail. But you plan for failure. You plan for th something to not go right so that you can cor make corrections as you need to. We have to not quit when that happens. Now, Several years, well, it's been probably close to 20 years ago, I was diagnosed as being diabetic. And Diane went with me to class, because I had to take a class on how to eat. It was time for break, so we went to get something to eat, and so we drove over to, of all places, Wendy's, because they have salads. And then I'm looking at the nutritional information. And at that point, I decided to fail. I said, I'm not eating anything ever again because I can't eat. It's all got carbs in it. I'm just done. I, got, I had a little pity party. I don't even remember what I ended up eating that day. But here's the thing. It took time. I had to pre-decide what I was going to do. And over that period of time, I learned things. It doesn't mean I can't have sweets. It just means I have to know what sweets I can have. Diane's favorite ice cream is Cold Stone. Mine is Dairy Queen. There's a couple of reasons behind that, but the most important one is, is I can have the same amount of ice cream at both places, but Cold Stone spikes my sugars. Dairy Queen doesn't. So, my preference and hers. So, when I go to Cold Stone, I Oh, not quite the kid size, but get a small one. But I've learned the things that I can do so I can be consistent. And now, my cons for the last quite a while now, I've consistently been averaging in the low hundreds, which is really good. I pre-decided it. And so what was that that caused that to happen? It was a process. I had to go through a process, and it was a long process process. I started off by drinking diet pop. I pre-decided I was going to drink diet pop and then I found out that diet pop caused me to gain weight so I pre-decided that I was going to drink smaller amounts of real pop and I've been able to manage it. 
So this is all about a process. And so through this process, we have to fall in love with it. So we have to fall in love with the process. Daniel didn't pray three times a day out of duty. He did it out of devotion. Daniel loved God and he loved his time with God that much. There was no ulterior motive. He was just consistently living his life in a way that would honor God. Too often we are obsessed with achieving a goal, whether that's a promotion or to lose weight or to win that trophy, earn that black belt, whatever it is, we get obsessed with achieving the goal and that obsession is a desire. And because of it, we become inconsistent. And we get mad when we don't achieve. Who's gotten mad when they don't achieve the goal that they said? Right. I got mad at first when I didn't achieve a goal that I had set for a different position at my work. But now it's like I'm, I fell in love with the process. I'm enjoying the, the process. And if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't care anymore. Because I, I can do what I do without any problems. If we fall in love with the process, that means we are falling in love with the journey. When we do that, sometimes we find out that the goal we were after is not what we really want. Win or lose, being successful or failing, it's all about the journey. At the beginning of each year, you probably are going to set a goal. We're getting close to that beginning of the first year. You're probably setting a goal and deciding what that was going to be. But you have to fall in love with the process. Now, before this current position that I've been wanting to get, I actually was trying to get into the training department. I spent four years on that journey. I learned a lot on that journey, and I never got there because that journey required a specific degree that I don't have, which is fine. I fell in love with the process, and the things that I learned on that journey have overflowed into the ministry. And they've overflown into my personal life. I can honestly look back now and say that those things that I did brought honor to God. This is why it's so important to pre-decide how we will do things in the now and in the future. We must understand the why, we must plan to fail, and we must fall in love with the process in order to be consistent. And all of that requires us to rely on God's help. Remember the words that Paul said, and this comes from the message version of this passage. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. With God's help, you can learn to be consistent and achieve every goal that God puts on your heart. My question to you this morning then is this. Where is God calling you to be consistent? Have you been asking yourself that question or have you been talking to God about it? Ask God to show you and then be ready when he does. Let God speak to you. And when he does speak to you, listen. That's the hard part, listening. And whether you are successful or not in the eyes of the world, know this one thing. You are accessible successful in God's eyes because you brought him honor. With God's help, we can. Father, as we prepare to go into our time of communion after hearing your message, Father, we just pray that you would take the words that we've heard this morning, Father, and we would use them in our life to be more consistent. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name. As we come into the time of communion this morning, it's a time of reflection, it's a time of remembrance, and as we come into this time, we need to understand all these things that God has done in our life. We need to remember all the good things that God has done in our life. A lot of times we don't recognize those things right away, but I was traveling the other day as I travel a lot. And 
there was a young lady who was text messaging on the highway at 75 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, she swerved over because she saw somebody on this side of her. And so she hit the guy next to her here. And then she yanked her steering back, hit the guy and the side rail on the highway on this side, and then spun across the highway in front of everybody. I made it through unscathed, but there's two other people who were unsuspecting that didn't. And I, as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, God, you know, how did this happen? I was very upset with her for text messaging at 75 miles an hour in the interstate to start with. But God brought me through that without a scratch. My car didn't get hit. The other people did. And so a lot of times we don't understand that God brings us through because I prayed ahead of time that I know every time I go through Nashville, it's, there's going to be an accident somewhere every time. And so I pray before I get there and I give it all over to God and I said, hey, bring me through this and make sure nothing happens. Bring me back home safe. And he always does. That worked for 59,800 miles worth of driving last year alone. So when we think about this, if we give it to God first, if we pre-decide to make that choice to give it to God first, then he will help us make the better decisions where to be to put that hedge of protection around us. But we have to be consistent in going to God first. I want you to remember those kind of things today as we go through the rest of our decision-making process. When it comes to this time today, I want you to remember this day, a very special day in the life of Aubrey as she begins that journey. We need to make sure that we surround her as she continues that journey. Bring her into communion. That means bringing us together in unity with one another, with God at the center. That's what that's all about. That's where the root word of this comes from, is to commune with one another, to join together in unity with one another. So as we remember today that we are gathered together for Aubrey and her life's journey, we made a commitment today, as we all said we do, to surround her with God's grace, love, and mercy. So I ask you then to remember this as she goes through the rest of her life, that we need to honor that commitment and we need to be consistent in doing so. On the night that Christ was given up, they had a meal, a Seder meal with the disciples, and he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat. Later on in the meal, he took a cup, and after he filled the cup, he blessed it. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as the passages go on, it tells us in the scriptures that each time that we take of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do it in remembrance of him, of his sacrifice, of his example, on how to live a godly life, on how to commune with others, on how to be a good Christian. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God.
like to send her to a care center, but she's a prior transplant patient, so there's a lot of issues surrounding her immune mm -hmm. system and things, and they're just kind of struggling with what to do. Just to keep him, okay. both in the peppers for continued healing and discernment therapies. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Diane has cataract surgery, her first of her cataract surgery on tomorrow. Wow, okay. <laughs> grandson that is going to have surgery the first of November. Okay. Open heart surgery. Oh my gosh. Okay. We need prayers for him. Okay. And, and his and his mommy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Jameson. Jameson. Wow. How old is Jameson? Five. Oh He'll be gosh. five in November. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. We'll do our best. Is there anyone Father God, we are excited today to welcome Aubrey into the family of Christ Jesus. We pray blessings of joy, love, health, and happiness over her. We pray for her parents and extended family that they will help her grow in her faith as she grows up, that they will all read your word and have their personal relationship with you. Father God, we thank you for Aubrey's life, and we praise you for such a beautiful blessing today. And Lord Jesus, we just have several on our heart today that we would like to talk about and pray you pray for them, Lord. We, we um, pray for Sharon's cousin, Susie, who has um, had open heart surgery and a prior transplant, Lord God. And we just pray your comfort over her. And we just pray that um, your blood just wash over her, Lord God. Help the caretakers to know exactly what to do for her. And... Um, when and where she should be released to and we just pray blessings upon her lord god as you see her through this trial we pray for a great grandson jameson and his mom and dad he is five years old lord god he's having open heart surgery i pray that you will watch over the doctor's hands i pray that they will be on their a-game lord god i pray that you will pull him through this perfectly and his heart will function absolutely normal. Lord God, I just pray that everything will go perfectly in this surgery and it will um, be a blessing as, as he recovers and he will not have any other trauma with us, Lord Jesus. I pray that no weapon formed against him prosper in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for Diane's surgery, um, for her cataracts. I pray for the doctor's hands over her eyes. I pray that you heal them, Lord God. I pray that it goes smoothly. I pray that it goes quickly. And she has no pain with this, Lord Jesus. And she is able to recover quickly and see perfectly in Jesus' name. And I pray for Mary, who has COVID, who has other uh, problems, Lord Jesus. I pray that you will watch over her and um, take this illness away from her, Lord God. You are the great physician. You cover everyone. Lord Jesus. And we just um, praise and thank you for their, these people's lives. And we thank you that you are in the process of all of this. And be with Mary so that she does not experience any ill problems with her COVID. And Father God, I, I lift up Steve and Don and Becky and Carla to you this morning. I pray for healing throughout their bodies. I pray that they will praise you through this trial in their life. When we praise and honor you, Father God, even the things in our lives, uh, the devil will flee and along with the pain will disappear. I pray they fight against the pain through praise and worship and prayer. I pray the blood of Jesus over all of these people. Cover and heal their bodies as only you can. We praise you for your love, your healing touch, your power over every illness and disease there is nothing you cannot heal if it is your will to do so. Thank you, Jesus, for the blessings and miracles in our lives, Lord God. 
Lord God, we want to praise you through the storms in this life, through every disaster that happens, through every flood, hurricane, fire, or earthquake, for these are signs of your coming. Father, please help this country pull together in times like these, right now to help the people in Florida and South Carolina who have lost everything through the Hurricane Ian. We know you control the wind and the waves, and you allow things to happen. You formed us, you are over all things. You call us to help one another and to love on each other through trials and disasters. Please get help to these people of Florida and South Carolina. Help them to feel your presence amongst them. Show them your love through people you sent to help clean up. So as it says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 6 and 7, your love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Let the Holy Spirit of the living God flow through America. Let, let, their, let us feel your presence, rise up to do your will, and move in the direction you choose for us. Please bring us back to one nation under God. In Jesus' holy, powerful name, we praise you, we honor you, and we give all the glory to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. Here's what consistency looks like. And this was, I don't know, Diane, I know Diane didn't read my sermon beforehand, but she posted this up on social media this morning. Faith doesn't always take you out of the problem. Faith takes you through the problem. Faith doesn't always take away the pain. Faith gives you the ability to handle the pain. Faith doesn't always take you out of the storm, but faith calms you in the midst of the storm. This is consistency a consistent faith. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to leave this place today. We ask that you would prepare our hearts right now and that we'll be, we would be open to the things that you tell us and show us. Help us to overcome our inconsistency. God, we are weak, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are made strong. We are made consistent. Father, we pre-decide today to take the message you have given us this morning and use the things that we have learned to live a life that consistently brings honor and glory to your mighty name. Help us to understand the why, to prepare for and be ready for the failures that may, and to help us fall in love with the process along the way. Thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, your grace, and forgiveness. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. This does conclude the online portion of our service. Those of you that have been with us online, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.